Hmm. Okay, so um, we're going to finish up with chapter 16. The stuff that will be on your final exam will be uh, chapters 14, 15, and 16. Um, so I put a uh, final exam study guide on Springboard already. So the exam for the um, chapter 14, 15, 16 test is there. And if you're going to take the comprehensive final, basically just collect up all your three study guides from before and then your study guide from this one, and that's what you'd study to, um, to take the final. Um, what we're going to be finishing up with on Chapter 16 is, uh, is conservation and biodiversity. Um, basically, as we are attempting to study biodiversity, it's really a complex process because some of the parts of biodiversity are incredibly hard to study. So um, biodiversity, first of all, we should get into a, a definition of what it is and the ways in which it is going to um, benefit humans. So, um, so uh, in talking about biodiversity, talking about the uh, physical environment, the species that are involved in the environment, um, and the, the communities, the way that all of those living species interact with the, um, with the environment in order to um, create a, uh, a living, changing thing at a specific time. Um, biodiversity is really important in that we talked about the different biomes uh, the last time we looked at the videos, uh, talking about the deserts and the tropical rainforests and the savannas and the, um, the oceans and lakes and rivers um, and all the different types of things that can survive in those different types of environments. Um, whenever we lose out on any of those particular aspects, like for example, um, if you destroy every one of a certain species of tree in a, in a forest, um, then we always risk losing things that are evolved uh, along with biodiversity, like um, certain plant extracts can be helpful in combating diseases, they can help to make us healthier, um, they can help to uh, prop up other species that are used in order to, uh, to make us healthy. So this is just one example, the chemical within the bark of the Pacific yew, which is called Taxol, is an effective treatment for ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. So then imagine if we were to uh, completely destroy the Pacific yew and we weren't able to synthetically create Taxol, then we could be losing out on a, a cure for different types of cancers. And so. As we're killing off species, uh, what if we're killing off that one thing that uh, cures diabetes or uh, cures cancer, cures AIDS? Um, it's always something that we're taking the risk of when we're allowing this loss of biodiversity. Um, here's some other ones that I think are really interesting. Uh, vinblastin and vincristin are two chemicals from the Madagascar periwinkle. Madagascar is kind of known as one of the uh, most biologically uh, diverse areas on the planet. Um, it's from a Madagascar periwinkle, which is basically a type of mollusk, like a little clam, um, that treats leukemia and Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if we lose that little clam, not even thinking about something um, that's really big, like a big Pacific U, but something that's little tiny, um, we could lose out on the treatment for leukemia. Uh, Ancrod is a chemical in a uh, Malayan pit viper, which is a type of snake, uh, that dissolves b blood clots and, it is, and is effective in treating some heart attack and uh, stroke patients. So uh, one of the interesting things that they do at Texas A&M University is they, um, they take these rattlesnakes and they get the ven venom out of the rattlesnakes in order to make anti-venom and in order to make um, anti-clotting uh, agents. And so if you lose out on that species of snake, you may lose out on things that can help people not die of heart attacks, not die of strokes. Um, epibetadine is a chemical from a small frog that's 2,000 times more effective than morphine. So morphine is a really um, harsh chemical that's a pain reliever. 
Um, and so what if we lose out on those, uh, those natural pain relievers that are uh, not addictive? Morphine is, is very highly addictive. So this is basically the medicine man syndrome. If you've ever seen the movie The Medicine Man where he's trying to not get a logging company to come in and cut down the rainforest. They want the trees and he finds the cure for cancer um, that's growing in one of these trees. He's trying to get the company to not come in and, and cut it down. Um, those type of things are happening all around the world um, in lots of different environments. Uh, more than just for their uses, what we call the uh, utilitarian value. So if a uh, animal product or a plant product has a value, that's called utilitarian value. Uh, but we also see animals and plants and different species uh, as having a naturalistic view. Um, for any of you guys who have been keeping up with the University of Akron news, uh, the University of Akron has put into uh, into effect a uh, project where they're going to green the campus. So they're going to go in and put more uh, natural areas, more trees. They're going to plant uh, these green little pastures around campus. Um, and they're going to spend $500 million to do that. And so they think that if there are more pretty green areas, that students will feel more relaxed, more in touch with nature. They'll be inspired for artistic value. And so um, there are lots of design companies that are trying to promote a naturalistic view or an appreciation of nature um, for its calming effects or its inspiring effects. Um, also, if you think about a lot of our species have symbolic value. If we were to lose out on the bald eagle, which is kind of a, a symbol of the United States of America, um, then we would be losing something that's part of our, our history, part of our heritage. And so aesthetic importance, the way that things look. So there's a lot of different things to take into, uh, into account <coughs> as far as why is biodiversity important. And it's important for a lot of different reasons. Um, biodiversity is not just plant species or animal species, it's actually all of the genes and alleles that are associated with those plant and animal and fungi and bacterial species because whenever you have uh, more uh, variation in DNA, more of those A's and T's and G's and C's put together in different ways, um, that is leading towards biodiversity. So we have uh, as things start to get more complex, as we start to see the emergence of new species, um, we see more biodiversity in our world. Uh, the more species that we have, the more possibility we have of um, variation and things becoming adapted to our environment um, that help them to be able to survive. And whenever we have varied ecosystems around the world, uh, we see this increase in the number of species. So biodiversity is more than just counting those species. Um, it's all of this genetic variability uh, within a species, within a variety of species, and within these ecosystems uh, that we find around the world. And so in the process of conservation biology, um, this is where we take uh, political aspects, we take scientific aspects, we take uh, conservation aspects. We um, talk to lots of different stakeholders in this, uh, in this view of how to best address or preserve the natural resources that we have here on Earth. Um, so how to best preserve the shoreline or how to best preserve a rainforest or how to best preserve a, uh, a natural grassland. And as you can imagine, um, a lot of times what this boils down to is money. Uh, money drives our being able to take care of our resources, like being able to preserve coastlines or send biologists out to uh, study the species. If a uh, private investor wants to go out and, and buy up tracts of land, then can they uh, rip down all the trees and all of the species on that land? Um, a good example of this would be um, where I used to live in Texas on the 108,000 uh, acre hunting ranch owned by one private person. 
Is he allowed to then uh, go in and burn down the whole ranch if he wants to because he technically owns that? Um, what about the mineral rights? What about the rocks and, and uh, things that are found underneath the soil? What about the air that's above the soil or the, the, uh, the space that's in that area? Um, there's a lot of different things at stake and like I said, most of the time it boils down to um, what kind of resources can we invest in that area? Um, so if I were to ask you a question on your uh, final like, if we choose to protect a specific parcel of land, uh, then what exactly are we protecting? What do you think? Okay, so I hear a lot of people saying uh, for uh, the genetic biodiversity, yes, we're looking to um, protect these different varied genes, uh, species diversity, so all the different populations in that area, and habitat diversity. If there's nowhere for those species to live, then you can't be protecting their biodiversity, so part of protecting biodiversity is protecting that, uh, that land and that habitat, so yes, um, it would be for all of the above. Um, so then we go about asking the question, where is the most biodiversity? If you were going to guess, where do you think is the most biodiversity? Besides Madagascar, where I just said. So what would Madagascar be an example of? So it would be a tropical rainforest. So most of the biodiversity is found there at the equator, which is where we would find most of the tropical rainforest. So the most biodiversity... Um, as you can see from this map, it's going to be found right along the middle, right along the equator. And then as we have um, less temperature and less moisture, we're going to find less biodiversity because we have less opportunities uh, to have variation there. So as you move away from the equator, that's when you are um, losing biodiversity. And that's naturally uh, not even through... Uh, through man-made extinction or anything like that. So naturally what happens is as we move away from the equator towards the poles, uh, biodiversity goes down. And so um, why are there more species of acre, uh, species in an acre of tropical rainforest than there are in an acre further from the equator, such as a uh, temperate forest or a prairie? Um, that is because of a variable called the latitudinal biodiversity gradient. So make sure that you write that down. The latitudinal biodiversity gradient. Okay. So in talking about the latitudinal biodiversity gradient, um, what that basically says in three steps is that uh, we are looking at the amount of solar energy available. So if you look at the Earth tilted on its axis, uh, the most solar energy is going to be available right at the equator. Uh, there's greater access to solar energy, which is the fuel for all life, and it's going to provide the energy for increased species richness. And as we go up towards the poles, um, that's where we start to see less and less solar energy available. If you think about places like Alaska or Norway or Denmark where they can have uh, 23 hours of darkness in the winter and uh, 23 hours of brightness in the summer, um, that is because of the way the Earth is situated on its poles. Um, the second factor that's uh, influencing biodiversity is the evolutionary history of an area. So what that basically means is that as we see communities diversifying over time, as we start to see species becoming adapted to those, uh, to those uh, environmental constraints, uh, we find that as more time passes along, or when we have events like uh, climactic events, like uh, an ice age or uh, a period where the earth is heating up, um, we start to see a, a greater amount of diversity in that area. So um, post ice age, we would see the evolution of organisms. There would be coming uh, a greater amount of diversity of those species um, due to that longer period of time. 
And then uh, finally, number three is the rate of disturbance. This is uh, basically those factors that occur independent of the uh, density. So when we see things like forest fires, when we see things like tsunamis, um, where we have some kind of uh, force that goes in and uh, destroys a community, uh, it then allows for new species to come in and inhabit and for the, um, the species to generally increase in diversity over time. So what you uh, generally see happening here is you see an amount of energy that's available, you see the evolutionary history of these species, and then you see um, whether or not something dramatic has happened in the environment um, in the foreseeable past. So um, these are things that uh, likely influence biodiversity. Um, our biodiversity hotspots, I believe there are... Uh, there are 20 of them that are found throughout the planet and they do kind of, uh, kind of change as the environment starts to change or as we start to see um, uh, environmental events like tornadoes or tsunamis or forest fires. Um, one of those places is the coral reefs in the Philippines. That's a biodiversity hotspot. Um, what we basically, uh, oh, 25 biodiversity hotspots around the world covers less than 1% of the world's area, but has 20% of the uh, world's species. So 20% of all of the species that are out there on the entire Earth are found in this 1% area of land. So notice where it is not. It's not in places like uh, Canada or Alaska. It's not down in Antarctica. It's not up in Siberia in Russia. Um, you're seeing these mostly found along the equator, uh, mostly found in high precipitation areas like uh, the rainforest. So we can see um, Costa Rica there in Central America. That's where we have a lot of our tropical rainforest. Um, the coral reefs in the Philippines is where we have a large um, amount of species found among the, among the coral. Coral themselves being... Um, a living animal species and um, in the islands of Madagascar where we see all of these um, diverse plant species and yes if you're thinking about the movie Madagascar it was based on that area um, so if I were to ask you a question like how does the location of biodiversity hotspots and the number of mammalian species correlate um, I'll give you a chance to read through those those answers there All right, does anybody think they have the answer? Okay, so I see a lot of you waving a peace sign at me, um, which means, yes, it is number two. Number one says biodiversity hotspots are located in places where the overall low biodiversity of mammals, um, that wouldn't be true because it would be high biodiversity, which is what it says in number two. Number three says biodiversity hotspots are usually found closer to the poles. You can tell just by looking at the, um, at the uh, graph there at the top that it's uh, found near the equator, not near the poles. Um, so the answer to that one would be uh, number two. And so um, one of these terms that I've used a little bit in the past but I don't know that I ever fully um, explained to you is island biogeography. Um, this is something where we look at the unique characteristics of species that are found on certain islands that are located in certain areas uh, that helps us to understand the maintenance and what happens when we lose biodiversity. So this is something that helps us to understand how the process of biodiversity going down happens. So um, one of the uh, historic, I guess, experiments that had happened is a scientist named E.O. Wilson who's been um, a biologist, a long-standing a uh, person who has studied um, the populations of species on islands. 
Uh, him and Daniel Simberloff exterminated all of the insects on multiple islands and then monitored the recolonization, so how the insects came back to the islands after they had been exterminated. And this was a kind of controversial experiment because imagine if we were to go through and kill every insect species uh, on an island. He took one that was a uh, small island, uh, covered everything over with a protective outer cover covering, and then he gassed everything that was on the inside. And he waited to see how did species come back to this island. And so a lot of biologists were really ticked off about this experiment because how ethical is it to go in and kill every insect species uh, on an island? And what if he had killed off an insect species um, that had the cure for cancer, the cure for diabetes? Um, in my opinion, this was an incredibly stupid and irresponsible uh, experiment, but this is the stuff that, um, that biologists do at certain points. Um, so he, he looked at how the insects came back to this island after they had been uh, exterminated from the island. And um, so what E.O. Wilson did was come up with this uh, theory of island bi biogeography, uh, which basically explains and predicts patterns of species diversity on islands. So it has these two components to it. Um, what we look at first is the area of effect, uh, which is the number of species inhabiting an island and the island's area. So we look at how big the area of the, uh, of the island is. And what it basically says is, as we have a bigger island, we start to have more species. And that should basically make sense to you. The bigger the place is, uh, the more chance there is to have, uh, have a larger amount of species. And then he looked at uh, the distance effect. So basically, the closer that an island is to the mainland, the more the insects of that area or the species of that area are going to look like the mainland. So if you remember back to our Galapagos Islands, the, uh, the place where Darwin studied all of the uh, theory of evolution, uh, looking back at the Galapagos Islands, they were so far away from the coastline of, uh, of the mainland uh, South, South America that they had species that were somewhat like South America, uh, but since they had been isolated for such a long period of time, they had uh, really shifted, uh, especially thinking about the finches. Uh, very similar to South America, but they had uh, speciated depending on what island they were on and what kind of food source they had available. Uh, if you look at the uh, tropical bird species that live in Hawaii, uh, the birds uh, show a common ancestor to the uh, California species of, uh, of birds, but because they were on Hawaii and they did have those unique food sources, they started to develop those long beaks that were good for, um, for gathering nectar. So basically what we're looking at here is how far are they away from the mainland and uh, how big are they. So generally bigger islands are going to have more uh, biodiversity. Uh, so what we call this is a dynamic equilibrium. What this basically says is uh, here along the left side, um, the rate of immigration, so how fast can uh, species come from the mainland or how fast can species come from other adjacent islands. And then along the right-hand side, uh, the rate of extinction, so how long does it take for species to become extinct. And then you can see the meeting of those graphs there in the middle, um, which will predict the number of species that are on that island. Um, so what we see, if you're looking down at the uh, pictures at the bottom, is the composition of species on an island is never fixed. So what that means is because it's an island, um, it's going to have uh, similar uh, species to the mainland, um, but because it's an island, things come and go off of the island um, and they never stay fixed because our environment never stays stable. There's always um, different weather patterns, different climates. Um, and so you can see that in this we have a, uh, an island that supports five species, but exactly which one of those five species occurs at any time uh, could be changing based on uh, immigration or emigration, things coming and going, um, and the rates of extinction of those different species. 
So uh, extinction is something that we are continually uh, fighting against in biodiversity uh, because not only does it happen uh, naturally out there in nature, naturally in nature, um, it's also being sped up because of uh, the human impact on the environment. Um, there are multiple cases of extinction that we see. Um, if you think back to the time of the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs went extinct when humans were not even uh, beginning to be there. Uh, but uh, a lot of cases that are happening because of uh, human intervention. Uh, this one is the passenger pigeon. Um, they used to be uh, millions and millions of them, uh, but they were hunted to extinction. And so the final passenger pig uh, penguin, finer pass passenger uh, pigeon uh, was in a zoo, and when it died in 1914, that was it. Uh, its species went extinct. Um, one of the ones that I always think of is uh, Lonesome George. He was the final uh, uh, organism of his species of Galapagos tortoise, and when he died, it was just like two or three years ago, maybe 2010, um, that was the final one of his species, and there will never be another one of those tortoises again. Um, so what we see in, ex in extinctions is sometimes we see uh, just a loss here and a loss there, or we may, may see this gra uh, huge mass extinction happening. So two categories. Uh, mass extinction is when a large number of species become extinct over a short period of time. Uh, in the history of the Earth, we have seen uh, five mass extinctions. If you look back to the one 65 million years ago, that's the one where the uh, dinosaurs were all um, destroyed off the, the face of the Earth, um, the one that my kiddo can probably tell you all about. Um, if you look back 250 million years ago, that was the largest mass extinction that we have ever seen. Um, so that was a period of time when something like 99% of all species at that point in time uh, died off, probably due to a, a climate event. Um, and so on the average, however, uh, we see uh, species lasting for about 10 million years, and then some of them last 100 million years. Uh, it just depends on how well suited they are to that environment. So these background extinctions are when we have a lower rate of extinction that's occurring all the time. So you can see those on our uh, chart in blue. There are certain things that are, are becoming extinct all the time. Um, like I said, usually as uh, due to things like the ice age or due to like uh, global warming, which we see happening uh, naturally and we see happening uh, now due to, to man. Um, so mass extinctions, huge extinctions, background extinctions um, are occurring at all points in time. So the factors that influence the risk of background extinction, uh, first of all, because of geographic range. So if some uh, species has an extended range, that allows it a better chance of survival because if it can go across a greater range, that gives it greater opportunity to not run into uh, a tornado or a forest fire or a tsunami that destroys the entire species. If something is found on a restricted basis, if it's only found on one small tiny island like the Galapagos Islands, it runs a huge risk of becoming extinct because it's only found in one specific area. So um, some species are restricted in their ranges and others have extensive ranges. Um, then we have the local population size. So if we have a large population, uh, then we have a greater chance of survival. If you have a uh, population that's only a few hundred or a few thousand, a small population size, it's much greater possibility that it's going to become extinct. Um, and then finally, habitat tolerance. Uh, if it has a broad tolerance, meaning it can survive pretty well in a wide range of conditions, it has a greater chance of survival than if it only can survive in one small, uh, very tiny area, like in the tropical rainforest, um, which the tropical rainforests are all uh, in danger of, of uh, being wiped out. So the factors that influence extinction, geographic range, how, how much they can spread out, uh, the population size, how big it is or how small it is, 
and then habitat tolerance, whether it can tolerate fluctuations or whether it has to be stable or, um, or they'll go extinct. So um, if I were to ask you a question like this, when was the largest mass extinction event? What did I say? Yes. There you go. Oh, 65. Oh, I was wrong. No, it is 250 million years ago. The last mass extinction event was 65 million years ago. The largest was 250 million years ago. So, oh, sorry about that. Um, so what we're finding out right now is that we are in the midst of a mass extinction. Um, so the sixth mass extinction will be um, man-made. It will be uh, due to what we do to the environment. Um, the current rates of extinction in every well-studied group of plants and animals support that a mass extinction is underway right now. Um, currently, we have 11% of all of our species endangered. We have 14% uh, that are threatened, 4% that are uh, endangered, and 50% of all species out there are on a decline. So the reason for this is all supported by uh, humans' damage of the environment. And so um, we are wiping out species like there has, uh, we've never seen extinctions like this before. So uh, 100 years from now, the species that we have out there will be uh, very greatly different than um, what we see there right now. Um, we see that due to uh, deforestation. Humans are cutting down the forest. Um, when we uh, deforest the tropics, uh, we see this loss of biodiversity because we're cutting down their, uh, the habitat um, in an area where there used to be a large amount of diversity and um, now there is not. And remember, uh, deforestation is not just so that we can uh, take the logs and use them for something. Um, we're also cutting down the rainforest to make uh, grazing pasture for, uh, for cows because of the people's um, insatiable cure for, for, uh, for beef. We eat our hamburgers, we want our steaks, and when we're eating cows, we're actually um, destroying our environment. Um, we see uh, species like the bonobos, which are the closest living relative of humans, uh, being driven close to extinction because we may not think of that here, uh, but in these tropical areas where the bonobos are, um, the uh, indigenous tribes, the, the people, are shooting and killing them to use them for food. And so um, as we start to lose the species that are very close to our own, um, that actually harms the, the humans that are there too. Um, we see humans that are... Uh, that are interfering being this uh, reduction of biodiversity. So here we have um, Rio de Janeiro. We see that as we are building up more and more skyscrapers and we're um, getting closer and closer to the rainforest, um, we see first of all the mixture of, of those animals that are uh, coming into the, the populated areas. So things like lions and tigers going into populated areas. And we see the reduction in uh, biodiversity of the plants and animal species. Uh, some ecosystem disturbances are uh, reversible, but some of them are not reversible. Some of this damage that we've already done, um, there is no way to turn back from what we have actually done. So even though the University of Akron is going to put $500 million into uh, getting green spaces back in downtown Akron, uh, they will never be able to bring back the species that have been destroyed by um, the, the urbanization of Akron as we, as we know it now. Uh, some disturbances are reversible, like in this case we see uh, Mount Everest. We have in May of 1980, um, it was a very, very uh, tall mountain, and then in September 1980, the top of it blew off and all of the uh, lava and, and the disturbances occurred. We lost a lot of biodiversity because that wasn't anything that had to do with humans. It had to do with uh, things that are naturally occurring um, out in our environment. And then if we look back at it uh, today, um, we see that a lot of that uh, disturbance has been uh, recounted for now that it's not erupting anymore. Uh, but some of the ones that are irreversible would be our damaging of the oceans. 
So as we are polluting the oceans, we start to see the loss of things like uh, whales. The blue whale is the largest mammal uh, in the world and the largest animal ever known to have been on Earth. Um, and as we are destroying and polluting our oceans and polluting the areas where they breed and polluting the areas where they feed, um, once we lose this species, uh, it can never come back. And so um, that is something that we are trying to combat because uh, if they can't ever come back, we can never see that biological diversity again. Um, disruptions of ecosystems can be uh, disastrous uh, for many reasons. Uh, sometimes we see that ecosystems are being polluted with what's called uh, an invasion of exotic species. So the invasion of species that are not native to that area. So um, the monk parakeet was something that was imported from South America as a pet. Uh, now in Chicago where people were releasing those parakeets and saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if my parakeet could fly around in my backyard? Well, they released them or they got out from pet stores. And uh, now in Chicago, these monk parakeets are so disastrous to the area that they're building these giant nests and there's now a breeding population of monk parakeets and as they build these giant nests on the electric poles, on transformers, on floodlights, um, we're starting to see uh, fires and uh, mass power outages and all kinds of problems because of something that was never meant to be a species that lived there but just happened to have uh, survived there uh, kind of by chance. Um, this next one is interesting, the brown tree snake. Um, the brown tree snake was an exotic species that was released on the island of Guam to help eradicate uh, some rats. They thought, oh, if we release this tree snake, he'll go out there and he'll kill off the rats. Um, but what they found is that these snakes tended to prefer the birds. And so since it's a tree snake, it's up in the trees where the birds are roosting, um, these snakes get out and they are um, eating all of the bird species and they're starting to see this loss of biodiversity for something they thought could help another problem, uh, but that created a bigger problem than was, uh, uh, than was originally there. Um, a lot of plant species are, uh, are uh, exotic species. The purple loosestrife was introduced in the United States as a garden plant, but then when it began growing on its own and uh, escaped and got into places like the wetlands, um, it was so aggressive that it could weed out all of the other species that were around it. And um, once it uh, muscled its way into the wetlands, it uh, killed off the native grasses and sedges and flowering plants, which were the foods for uh, a lot of the animals that were in the area. And when you kill off the foods of those animals, then those animals decline also. So uh, plant species can be really invasive. The zebra mussel is something that we're combating in the Great Lakes right now. Um, it's something that was most likely introduced on the hulls of ships as they were, um, as they were faring their way through the, uh, through the Great Lakes. And um, as those barnacles uh, were released into Lake Erie, um, they actually started to grow in, um, in outtake pipes for, um, for industrial facilities because they would be dumping warm, warm water out into Lake Erie. And those zebra mussels could uh, grow so quickly and so invasively that they were clogging those pipes. They were destroying the um, small fish, eliminating food supplies for larger fish. And now the sturgeon, which are found in uh, the Great Lakes, are actually on the endangered species list uh, because they don't have their foods anymore because the mussels came in and, and destroyed the native habitat. So these were all cases of, um, whoops, we messed up nature. And these were all cases of, of uh, human whoops. This was not nature's whoops. So um, this one is actually one of my favorite stories. So if you ever... Um, get a chance to watch the movie called Cane Toads Are Coming. Um, in Australia, they brought in these uh, cane toads and um, they were supposed to help destroy um, agricultural pests like flies and locusts. So they thought, oh, these cute little frogs, they'll come in, they'll eat all the flies, they'll eat all the locusts. And what they found was that the cane toads were so well capable of uh, 
multiplying that they actually became such a pest that they took over like half of Australia and uh, people as they are driving their cars on the highway the highways are covered with these toads during breeding season and they cause all the cars to break down as the cars underbellies get clogged up with dead frogs as they run over them um, the cane toads are uh, breeding everywhere and they have a uh, poisonous sack on their back and so as uh, people are living in those areas like they would let their dogs out to go play in the backyard and the dogs would go bite the toads that were hopping around and it would kill their dogs. Um, they were finding that uh, teenagers had realized uh, that they could smoke this uh, poison off of the toad's back in order to get high. So these teenagers were going around licking the toads and smoking the toads. And, um, and so it's, it's become something that's been a, a really big pest uh, that has really hurt Australia financially and medicinally and, and agriculturally. Um, so you never really know what's going to happen when you get these invasive species. You might end up licking, licking toads. Um, watch the movie. It's hilarious because they interview people who have just smoked toad and um, they're all stoned and it's funny. <laughs> it's called Cane Toads Are Coming. So um, I will do the last uh, lecture on uh, Tuesday or Thursday, that'll be your last assignment. I already put up the study guide, and so uh, if you need to begin studying now, please do that. If there's any more of those, um, any more of those idea forms, I'll take them. And anybody else who needs to talk to me, I will be right here. Okay.